Hi, everyone. Um, I'm an assistant professor of geography here at Dartmouth. Um, I'll jump into the introduction for Juan DeLara, who is an associate professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California and the founding director of the Latinx and Latin American Studies Center. He's the author of Inland Shift, Race, Space, and Capital in Southern California, published by the University of California Press in 2018. Dr. Delar's research focuses on social justice, urban ecologies, and the intersections between data, race, and power. His articles and essays have appeared in publications including the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, Environment and Planning E, Nature and Space, Labor Studies Journal, and American Quarterly. The title of his talk is Environmental Racism and Sustainability, A Lesson from California. Um, if you have questions while Professor DeLar is speaking, you can put them in the chat and he will get to them at the end of his lecture. Um, I do encourage you to do that and to enjoy the talk with that. I'll turn it over to Professor DeLar. Thank you very much, Professor Scott. I want to thank Yolanda and Kate uh, for organizing and helping so much uh, to make this happen today. And I will say that I, although I am in the American Studies and Ethnicity Program uh, Department here at USC, I'm actually a trained geographer um, and I got my PhD in geography from Berkeley. Uh, so I'm always happy to be in the company of geographers to talk about these issues. Um, so today what I want to do um, is first, you know, besides welcome you, I want to talk about sustainability uh, and economic uh, and social justice within the context of environmentalism, environmental racism, etc. Um, so let me make sure that I get my talk here. What I'm going to be doing is just be going back and forth between showing you some slides, talking, showing you some more slides and talking some more. Um, I am going to uh, have enough space at the end of this talk to hopefully to have an engaged conversation about some of the ideas that I bring uh, forward today. Uh, and then sort of any questions that you might have about uh, some, of the, some of the topics, some of the themes uh, that I that I discussed during my presentation. So I look forward to to having a great conversation after I give my talk today. So the 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 main um, question I want to just start off with uh, talking about and sharing with you the main question for my research today. Um, let's see here. Make sure that I can bring this down. I promise that I will try to get this as smoothly as possible. Um, what I want to focus today is to try to on this question, which is really driving my thinking right now, which is, can we have sustainability without social justice? And this is in the context of a lot of different things, but I'm today I'm going to I'm going to focus specifically on my research in Southern California around regional economic development policy. But I think if you if you sort of step back from the immediate content of my talk today, this question about sustainability and social justice is really key to understanding current debates about the Green New Deal, uh, questions about uh, the global climate change and the climate gap and vulnerability and who's vulnerable to what kinds of environmental uh, problems that are emerging, uh, that are present uh, in our societies. And the other thing that I want to talk about is how do we deal with urban environments and questions about uh, urban issues like social justice, racial justice, Black Lives Matter, uh, etc., within the context of producing specific kinds of urban economies and specific kinds of urban landscapes, right? And so it is a, a, a very specific discussion today about Southern California, but I think that the frameworks that I'm deploying here and that I'm sort of playing with and, and sort of trying to make sense of can really be applied to uh, several other uh, larger conversations about the intersections uh, uh, between urban space, um, ecology, and social justice. So. I will begin uh, my conversation by trying to answer that question. Okay, so before I move into uh, thinking about some of the epistemic frameworks that are guiding my research on environmental racism and environmental justice, 
I want to talk about two things that I have moved away from in my research on environmental justice. And those are two things that I think have really shaped the way that the literature, the scholarship on environmental justice has sort of engaged with these questions about uh, race, the environment, and social difference. So the first thing that I've moved away from in my research um, is the focus of environmental justice scholarship on distributive models of justice, meaning you know, how are negative environmental outcomes disproportionately distributed to communities along race and class lines. And this really shapes so much of the discussion, so much of the literature on environmental racism. Uh, so much of the debate that surrounds the definition and the mapping of environmental justice has focused on where polluting facilities have been located and how these locations have exposed certain social groups to negative health impacts and premature death. And I'm using premature death here in the way that Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about racism and structural racism as the exposure or the state sanctioned vulnerability to premature death, right? So what we end up with in much of the early discussions about environmental justice is a map, a map that illustrates how pollution has been distributed and how this is, has affected different racial and economic neighborhoods or class neighborhoods. Um, Gordon Walker has written about this in a, in a great article uh, that he published in 2009 about the distributive model of environmental justice. The second debate uh, in environmental justice that I've moved away from centers on the intentionality, intentionality of locating pollution sources in poor black and brown neighborhoods. Laura Pulido has especially written about this idea about intentionality. Uh, and this normally takes the shape of arguing over which came first, the concentration of toxics and toxic facilities in specific neighborhoods, or the concentration of poor racialized communities uh, in neighborhoods that then attract uh, toxic pollution, right? And this which came first debate is a very common trope that is present in a lot of uh, literature on environmental justice. And I have deliberately moved away from that to think more specifically about um, how we can think about not intentionality, but on systemic ways that race, class, and urban ecologies intersect with one another. And this has really taken the, the shape of looking at three critical lenses that shape my work on the environment. The first is understanding uh, space as a dynamics process, thinking about the intersections of space and racial capitalism. And the third is how do we talk about nature in conversation with the production of space and the logics of racial capitalism as dependent on both nature and space. So those are the three lenses that shape the, the way that I'm thinking about uh, environmental justice now. So in fact, I think it's difficult for me to even think about urban ecologies, urban systems, without reflecting on how race, capitalism, and power have shaped everyday landscapes across the globe. This means that the production of urban space should be seen as a process in which local environments are produced through a set of institutions and actors that are aligned along positions of power. And these positions of power, of course, are reflected in things like race, class, and gender hierarchies that, that tend to dominate our society. So urban environments are not separate from this process. As I have written with Laura Pulido, environmental justice activism and scholarship have been constrained by its ability, inability to theorize how the logics of ecological devastation are central to the machinations of racial capitalism. So my work attempts to break free from these constraints by thinking of these things together as opposed to separate from one, one another. And my thinking has been influenced by scholarship in critical ethnic studies, urban political ecology, environmental justice, and of course, geography. More specifically, I use theories of embodiment and positionality to examine the multiple scales of everyday precariousness. And in my research, I ask how ecological precariousness is written into the everyday landscape, 
and how this can affect different groups of people because of where they are located in the social hierarchy of race, class, and power that permeates our society. And of course, these are not um, new uh, uh, processes by any means. So I wanna show you here some slides that illustrate what I'm getting at and I think highlight these intersections. Um, and when I talk about race, class, and urban natures, we can think about um, things like plantation ecologies, right? And, whether, and as I'm going to discuss in my talk today, mostly around the logistics ecologies and logistics economies and the way that race, class, and space intersect with one another, we can look back to the historical role that racial capitalism has played in the expansion of American society, all the way back to things like plantation ecologies, where white slave owning planters used the levees to open up new land for cotton development. And this is the work that uh, Walter Johnson has written about extensively, and also the work that uh, Clyde Woods has written about in the Mississippi Delta region. The river was used to transport cotton to the Gulf port and then to ships that delivered it to the cotton gins of England that were at the height of the industrial revolution and the pressure to expand economic development. So the logics of capitalist accumulation created dangerous conditions because it placed more people at risk of flooding. And after the civil war, the federal government supervised levee building along the lower reaches of the Mississippi River uh, in order to provide farmland to white landowners. Uh, and in some cases, African-American men were paid 10 cents an hour to work on building the levees. And others uh, places, they were forced to, to labor with no pay. And thus we have conversations about imprisonment, carceral geographies, the role that forced labor has played, forced racialized labor has played in the expansion of America's economy. Um, and this image is uh, a group of levee workers uh, in Louisiana in 1935, um, and a great description by Christopher Morris, who talks about how levees propped up Jim Crow as surely as they segregated land and water, right? So I encourage you, if you're interested in these historical intersections of race, class, and urban and regional natures, to read the work of Clyde Woods and Walter Johnson, especially to think about how uh, the, the sort of ecologies of the Mississippi Delta region were at the center of both race and class development formations um, historically and have been uh, all the way through the most recent iteration of this, of this which has been, of course, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and you can see, you know, here's another great ship. I'm not going to read it, but, you know, the way that Walter Johnson talks about this is that entire system of racial capitalism provided the underlying logic for producing the Mississippi Delta's growth and development. Uh, and if you, if you pay attention here, there are going to be very similar arguments that I make about the expansion of the logistics economy, which is, of course, dominated by companies like Amazon today. Uh, the growth of these kinds of regional economies, the growth of these transportation systems, which included the investment in infrastructure, was a massive reworking of nature and a massive reworking of nature that provided profits to some at the expense of both ecological and economic precarity to others. Right? And this is um, an image uh, of slaves, uh, enslaved black labor loading cotton at night and onto one of the ships that was tra uh, traveling down the Mississippi uh, River. Okay. Okay. So with that kind of historical framing, what I wanna talk about is why this framing is useful and what does it mean for my research? I found that this kind of approach to urban ecologies, regional ecologies is useful because it provides the methodological tools that enable me to examine the deep connections that are embedded in urban nature human relationships. For example, in my research into the growth of the logistics industry, which was driven by state investment in port and transportation infrastructure, I use Southern California to examine how precariousness is written into the urban landscape. For me, 
urban planning and governance cannot be separated from the multiple ways that ecological issues intersect with race, class, and social difference. In fact, urban life is shaped by a tenuous relationship with nature that falls along notions of racial and social difference. So let me get to speak more specifically about how this manifests in my work. Uh, and let me begin uh, a description of my work by telling you a little story that happened in 2006 when then president of the Port of Los Angeles Harbor Commission opened his first public meeting by saying, and he was speaking about the ports of LA and Long Beach, which are the largest ports in the United States. And he, was, and he said, in describing these port systems, this port is killing people and we've got to cut it out as fast as we can. Um, and I was struck by this comment by the head of the port commission because it was an acknowledgement that the port of LA, the port of Long Beach, was essentially functioning as a diesel death machine that was responsible for causing more than 13,000 new cancer cases per year in the four counties that make up the Southern California Air Basin region. The, court, the port complex that he was describing includes the ports of Los Angeles, the ports of Long Beach, and this has, these ports have been especially toxic to Black and Latinx residents who live near truck routes, who live near loading facilities and warehouses in places like South Los Angeles and the, the place that I write about, the Inland Empire, which is uh, two inland counties about 35 miles uh, inland of, of LA County. And these same port regulators who were describing the port as a, you know, as a killing machine were also responsible for investing billions of public dollars into expanding the port and expanding the operations. And in fact, this idea that the port was killing people was um, uh, you know, an acknowledgement that the state vis-a-vis -vis, you know, these harbor commissions had in fact invested billions of public infrastructure dollars in um, you know, a development regime that essentially was now killing poor black and brown people in Southern California. And so part of what I have done in my research is to argue that Southern California's commitment to a port-based development strategy was responsible for cementing racial, environmental, and class precariousness into the region's ecological fabric. And what's fascinating about this story is that the ports and logistics in particular have been framed by political and economic leaders as a sustainable development model. So one of the things that has happened in post sort of deindustrialization de LA, post globalization LA has been that policymakers have scurried to try to find a way to recuperate many of the manufacturing jobs that have been lost because of globalization. And one of the industries they have essentially tied their, their, their fortunes to is the logistics industry. And thus they have spent billions of public funds in supporting logistics growth in Southern California. The same, of course, uh, industry that was being described as a sort of diesel killing machine. So I wanna show you um, a couple of slides here that give you a sense of what that landscape looks like. So, uh, oh, that's strange, cancel. Sorry, folks, this is giving me, uh... okay, can you see my slide? Yeah, got it. Um, so this is uh, when I talk about the, the growth of, of, of the ports and how the growth of the ports was supported uh, by this shift in globalization, but also by this massive infrastructure spending that uh, local policymakers invested in growing the ports, you can see uh, the, the, the number of TEUs, um, which are uh, 20 foot equivalent units um, that have essentially allowed the ports of Long Beach and LA. By the way, when I say the ports of Long Beach, for those of you who are not familiar, they're right next to each other. 
So it essentially functions as one port. They're right next to each other. You, it's hard to pull them apart, but uh, they are operated by different uh, harbor commissions, but they oftentimes more recently have cooperated uh, with one another in order to support growth. So if you combine both the Long Beach and the Los Angeles ports, you can see just the amount of uh, just the massive um, um, control or the, so the, the lead that the ports of Southern California are in when you're thinking about imported goods uh, into the United States. And it used to be ports in the Pacific Northeast and New York and New Jersey and also ports in Oakland were much more important in the, the economy of the United States, but that has changed within the past 30 years with the growth of LA and Long Beach as the major importers of mostly Chinese uh, goods. Okay, and here are some of the key projects that have been invested in by the city. So when I talk about spending billions of dollars, um, all of these companies, uh, and cargo terminals, um, both private investment in these ports, but also public investment, mostly in the way of infrastructure, uh, spending uh, the China shipping container, Evergreen, I'm sure some of you have seen containers with these, or, or trucks with containers on, on, on them moving down the freeways wherever you live. Uh, but these are all um, major uh, investment sites that have been invested in by by the ports of LA and the ports of Long Beach. And you can look at the capital investment spending. This is just for the port of LA, not for the port of Long Beach. Um, but you can see here uh, capital expenditures be in from fiscal year five to fiscal year 14, and just a tremendous amount of investment that has happened uh, in terms of building regional infrastructure to support the growth of the ports. And when I say regional infrastructure is because a lot of the growth that has happened as I write about in my book is actually not located right along the ports, but it's located in inland counties in order to support the growth of massive new warehouses. Uh, and you can see why that's necessary. These are um, you know, the, the container traffic um, and you can see that a lot of the container traffic from LA, Southern California goes down to like Dallas, Fort Worth, but also that ends up in places like Chicago, which is the major hub and also into the East Coast. Um, and you know, this is produced these kinds of urban landscapes in Southern California. This is one set of warehouses, a warehouse cluster, where if you come to Southern California, you drive down the 10 and the 60 freeways, uh, beginning in downtown LA, actually a little bit south of downtown LA, you will just see massive warehouse structures like this uh, up and down all along the, the freeway corridor there. And the inside of these spaces look like this. This is an Amazon distribution center in 2017. Um, and of course, we just went through a process in which uh, workers in um, uh, Alabama were organizing in, in one of the warehouses in Alabama. But this is what these facilities look like. And as I write in my book, um, many of the workers who work in these facilities, when we're talking about logistics workers, we're also talking about uh, a large group of women workers and a large group of people of color who are earning low, relatively low wages in this industry. I'm gonna skip that. And then what you can see here is just the, the diesel uh, related cancer cases uh, that I outline in the book. This is in the inland counties that I write about, not in, um, in, in coastal LA, uh, but I, I wanted to show this to you because uh, to give you a sense of the spread is, is pretty wide. So while the Harbor Commissioner talked about over, thir over 3,500 new cancer cases, we know that this was actually a, a, a bigger number because it was also affected people in um, inland counties. Okay, let me end that part and get back to some of the points that I wanna make. Um, So in November, uh, in November of 2006, getting back to this, to this comment that the port commissioners made, um, port commission leaders addressed this problem of a, the diesel death machine 
by passing the San Pedro Bay Ports Clean Air Action Plan. San Pedro Bay Ports is a way to talk about both the LA and the Long Beach ports together. The document that they passed, the, the Clean Air Action Plan, called for a 45% reduction in port-related pollution within five years of implementation. Um, it also included the framework for a clean truck program that reduced diesel emissions by replacing or retrofitting the more than 16,000 drayage trucks that moved shipping containers from the docks to inland railroads and warehouses like the ones I just showed you. Um, so they were forced to do this, you know, leaders were forced to do this because they were being sued and held legally responsible for killing people and for making them sick because of their support and investment in the, por in the ports. So they used the Clean Air Action Plan in order to decouple port expansion from pollution. And this was their formula for the theory that port growth was part of a sustainability or a green growth agenda. And of course, this goes back to ideas about technical fixes, ideas that you can resolve some of the contradictions of capitalist development by uh, implementing technical solutions that will essentially create a green form of capitalism that will allow for sustainable growth. And I wanna spend some time uh, sort of thinking about this sustainability model, this idea of a sustainability discourse, and to link it to regional economic development and why it's, it can be problematic uh, if we don't think about these sort of intersecting ways that sustainability also must include uh, labor and, and racialized labor in particular. So ideas about sustainability within regional planning are based on environmental limits to growth, debates that occurred in the 1970s. And ultimately, sustainability became a political strategy to manage local and global resources. In my work, I argue that human labor and human life must also be accounted for when we discuss urban nature and sustainability. After all, there is no urban without the metabolic relationship between humans and the work that they do to produce the built environment out of natural resources. Put another way, the production of urban natures, and by that I mean things like cities, neighborhoods, downtown areas, cannot be understood without the role that laboring bodies play in their production. So think back about the levees, think about plantation economies, think about logistics economies. All of those rely not only on the resources, the natural resources that go into building them, but as human bodies working with those natural resources in order to produce those, those particular paces, uh, spaces. And we can also think about, of course, bodies and humans as part of nature. And what do I mean about this? Uh, where do I get this idea from? And I borrow here from the work of Nick Heinen, Maria Kaika, and Eric Swingado, who define urban political ecologies as the human and physical, cultural and organic, the myriad transformations and metabolisms that support and maintain urban life, such as, for example, water systems, food, computers, hamburgers, all of these things always combine infinitely connected physical and social processes. So I use this idea to argue that if the Clean Air Action Plan or any other plan is going to be a green growth strategy for Southern California's economy, then we should consider how this vision of sustainable development affects workers, particularly those who are affected by their status as racialized labor. One of the most powerful critiques of pro-growth or green economy policies surrounding the, the, the ports came from logistics industry workers who challenged the dominant green economy model by insisting that their labor be included in the definition of sustainability. Um, there are approximately 17,000 trucks that service the San Pedro Bay ports um, at the time that the plan was passed in 2008. And most of these trucks are owned by individual owner operators or by very small companies. At the same Harbor Commission meeting where the Harbor Commission president said these ports are killing people and we need to do something about it. 
and then continued to pass legislation that would expand port, you know, expand port operations. Well, there were other people in that meeting, and one of the other people in that one of the other persons in that meeting was a truck driver. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, some of his comments. And this is what he said. And he said, my name is Luis Ceja. I'm the one that brings the things out to the warehouse, the one that brings the stuff to your stores. Uh, and Mr. Ceja had been a truck driver for more than seven years. His introduction, how he introduced himself as the one that brings the stuff to your stores, was an eloquent way to make himself visible within the circuit of actors that constitute the regional logistics economy. His presence and his description of the deep connection between his labor and his truck really tied him into discussions about the environment. He was visibly upset when he told commissioners, I hate my truck because the pollution makes people sick. My truck is responsible for the pollution that my family and all the families around here are exposed to. For immigrant truck drivers like Luis Ceja, the ecological connections among his work, deadly diesel and global logistics were an everyday reality. Mr. Ceja's comments are a reminder of the multiple ways that immigrant truck drivers and their biophysical resources, meaning their body, their labor, have been central to the production of urban logistics and the urban log logistics economy. Mr. Seha's comments were also a reminder of the important role that subaltern populations, e.g. immigrant truck drivers, racialized labor, et cetera, play in wrestling with and making sense of the complex social and natural relationships that produce everyday urban life. Scholars must absolutely account for these knowledges by centering their roles in the production of urban natures. As central as truck drivers are to producing the urban landscape of Southern California, the port's Green New Deal plan did not include labor protections that would make it easier for drivers to improve their wages and bargain for better wages. As I argue in my writing, this is an incomplete ecological approach. Indeed, any proposed fix to the economic and environmental crisis of deadly development must account for how specific industries consume and deplete the biophysical resources of devalued communities, including racialized labor. So I want to end there, and then we can have a conversation, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Delora. That was excellent. Um, I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, I think we're a fairly small group, so I'm wondering if folks can't just unmute themselves and jump in, and we can try it that way. If that doesn't work, we can maybe go to a more orderly fashion. So feel free to unmute and, and ask your questions. I can start. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, right off the bat, are there is there some sort of organizing going on about, you know, the growth of the ports in terms of their sustainability and labor practices? Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of organizing. Um, one of the things I didn't show was a slide uh, that shows some of the the sort of the development of, of organizing. There, there you know, the environmental justice movement in, in Southern California has paid particular attention to the ports because of this major role that it, the ports have played in causing dislocation, because, you know, a lot of the, the expansion of the ports has also been in poor black and brown communities. So you have groups like the East Yards Coalition for Environmental Justice that are in Southeast LA that have been organizing against the expansion of uh, um, train uh, facilities where they're loading, you know, essentially trucks onto trains to be uh, shipped out to different parts of the United States. And much, you know, there's so much diesel involved um, in, in, in those facilities 
that neighborhoods that are around those facilities are especially vulnerable. If you're not familiar with diesel pollution, it you know the major problem is PM 2.5, uh, PM particulate matter 2.5. So it's the size of the pollution that buries itself deep into your lungs and then causes these kind of health effects. And the danger of PM 2.5 exposure is directly related to proximity, meaning the closer you are to the source pollution, the more uh, vulnerable you are to that pollution. And so many of the facilities are located in these poor neighborhoods. And as the port was expanding, there was investment in growing these facilities to, in, to essentially expand their capacity to absorb more goods that are being brought into the United States. And so there have been a lot of site, site fights, right? There were a lot of effort, individual, like every time there was going to be an expansion, either of the freeway to accommodate more trucks or a, a loading facility to accommodate more trains, there were these ongoing fights. And it culminated in, in the mid 2000s with this fight around the Clean Air Action Plan, as essentially all of these environmental groups got together and said, we need a regional strategy because we can't keep fighting these individual fights. And that focusing on that regional strategy was also sort of wrapping their heads around that in order to talk about environmental justice, they had to talk about economic development. Uh, and they had to talk about public investment in regional infrastructure. And so the whole conversation around environmental justice then became policy debates about things like public financing of infrastructure spending. Um, and it was, you know, I think it, 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 you know, laid bare some of these intersecting connections that I've tried to discuss in my conversation. Um, and the other point is that, yeah, many of these workers were also saying, we are, you know, part of this process. We are, uh, you know, part of these natural systems, and we also need to be considered as part of that conversation. Um, and so, yeah, there were so there were a lot of different environmental fights that were taking place throughout the region that culminated in this action plan um, in the mid 2000s. Excellent. Um, Fernando, I think you're on mute now. If you want to go and ask a question. Oh yes, can can you hear me? I would just I can <laughs> just yes. Your chat. Can you hear me? I can yes. Thank you. Oh good. No, it's good to see you, Juan de Lara. Uh, yeah. I, I was born and raised in Calexico, ah, in Imperial Valley. Yes, yeah. I know exactly. He, that was he on was the born way. And raised in the Coachella Valley. Yes. And both are the desert valleys. Yes. And uh, I went to Dartmouth. I'm on the board of visitors of the Nelson Rockefeller Center yeah. for Public Policy. And I'm glad great. to see it sponsored. Yes. Thank great, David so and Yolanda. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you two things. Uh, one, if you could just quickly give us like a, a profile of the size of the communities of color, Latinos, indigenous, African-Americans, yeah. Asians, in, in, the, in Los Angeles County and also in the Inland Empire counties of San Bernardino and uh, Riverside. That, that was the first point. The second point is uh, <clears throat> your focus has been on the logistics industry mm -hmm. and uh, the, what, you've, uh, what you're writing about is really powerful. And what I'm, and my question is what lessons can be learned uh, when we think of the oil and gas industry mm. and how oil and gas, the industry has affected, continues to affect in a very big way. And as you know, in Sacramento, uh, though we have democratic super majorities, uh, a Senate committee was unable to adopt uh, a legislative proposal uh, with respect to oil and gas. So, so um, uh, oil and gas is a, they're older players because they've been around a long time, but they, they're still very influential. So what lessons 
can be learned or applied from the, I, I'd say, largely failed efforts. Mm -hmm. Take fracking, for example. Yeah. Uh, in trying to figure out how to how to uh, <clears throat> produce racial justice, mm -hmm. social justice, uh, in relation to the logistics industry. Yes, thank you so much for that question. I'm, I'm glad to see somebody from Calexico, from Calexico here. Uh, Calexico was off in the place, or Mexicali really, where we would go. Uh, I grew up as a migrant farm worker and um, we were always too poor to go to the dentist. But whenever we did go to the dentist, we would go to Mexicali for the dentist because that's where dentists were cheaper. Um, and it was also the place where we could eat some of the best Chinese food that you could get. And the bet and the place where you, we could also load up on dulces to get more cavities to go back to the dentist, of course, because there was, you know, a lot of stores to get candy, Mexican candy. That's where we would go. So I have fond memories of Colexico um, and I have uh, a lot of family who actually some family that lives in Mexicali. Um, so so thank you for, for that when we question. Say, when we say Calexico, it's also, it's really Calexico and Mexico. Of course, yes, yeah. And it's the one place that was actually hotter than Coachella sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so thank you for that question. Anyways, we could talk about that for a long time. Uh, let, me, let me show you um, one of the things that I talk about in my book um, and, and that I... I didn't show you today, I kind of glanced over it, is exactly this point that you made, uh, Fernando, which was, you know, as I argue in the book is, as there was increased investment and the growth of the logistics industry, this happened at the exact same moment in which um, the white population declined and the Latina Latino population grew. So you can see in 1980, which was kind of what people define as the marker or the turn of the globalization, uh, deindustrialization phase, um, there were, you know, the population of, of the regions that I'm looking at was 73% white, um, only 19% uh, Latina and Latino, smaller than that black and, uh, and Asian Pacific Islander, and the top one is Native American. Um, and then you can see just the radical change that happened in that 30 year period uh, until 2010, which is where I'm writing about, where the white population shrank dramatically uh, and, and the Latino Latino population became the largest group uh, in the region. So when I'm talking about exposure to ongoing and growing uh, environmental inequities, one of the things that we have to think about is just the kind of the massive reworking of the region's uh, racial population. Um, not only is it about locating in specific neighborhoods, but it's also thinking about the growth of this industry in an area that is also rapidly transforming. So we're talking about who's making up these workers, mostly people of color and immigrants, Who's living in these neighborhoods? Mostly people of color and immigrants. Um, and so, yes, there is a kind of confluence or what I call the re-territorialization of race and class, a confluence that takes place where devalued former industrial spaces that really, if you think about it, uh, LA's economy and geography was produced by this kind of post-war industrial boom that provided middle-class uh, lives for a growing influx of white migrants from other parts of the United States. With kind of deindustrialization, that geography collapsed. A new geography was put in place, with this, which was focused on the port economy. And those jobs, instead of being blue collar, unionized, jobs that provided a good life for people have become service sector jobs like janitorial jobs or logistics jobs for these workers that do not provide those kinds of, 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 of livelihoods and that are also killing them through the production of these ecologically devastating landscapes. So that's kind of the, the confluence that I write about in, in the work that I do. The second question that you ask um, is about, you know, what lessons can be learned and one of the things that I'm working now on is exactly this question. So I'm looking at 
rural California now. Um, and, and when I talk about rural California, I'm looking at places like the Coachella Imperial Valleys, especially around the Salton Sea, uh, which as those of you who may not know is an increasingly toxic place because of the development that has happened in places like Arizona and California and Las Vegas. The water that was going into the Salton Sea is now being used for development, um, uh, water from the Colorado, Colorado River. And it's producing these kinds of environmental devastating uh, landscapes for primarily uh, Mexican, Latinx, immigrant populations in those neighborhoods. And the other place that I'm looking at is fracking in the Central Valley and the effect that fracking is having on things like pollution and things like water quality. Uh, Dolores Huerta, who used to be uh, the founder of the, who was the founder of the United Farm Workers Movement, uh, is now working on things like water issues and availability of water in the Central Valley, uh, in places like Arvin and Lamont and Bakersfield. Uh, and these places are also, of course, the home of uh, a lot of oil uh, speculation and fracking that is also polluting these neighborhoods and these, and these communities. Uh, so on the one hand, they're being exposed to pesticides, on the other hand, they're being exposed to these other kinds of extractive industries that are pollu pr polluting their water. And all of this is, of course, related to when we're talking about things like global climate change, we're talking about green new deals. These neighborhoods are, for the most part, invisible because they are not in urban areas. They are kind of rural landscapes. Uh, and, and many of these places are not on the radar when, when these policy decisions are being had. So my focus is on infrastructure, right? Again, this is where I go back to infrastructure, uh, that I'm really paying attention to the production of precarious ecologies by looking at infrastructure and development. Okay, it looks like we have a question here in the chat from, uh, excuse me if I pronounce the name wrong, Susan Gonzalez which says, uh, would you say that work around the expansion of warehouses in the IE and the effort to include community benefits agreements with the building of these new huge warehouses like the airport expansion in SB and the World Logistics Center in Mobile is an example of how we can start to include labor, health, et cetera, when talking about environmental justice? This is great. Well, who asked this question, first of all, and how do you know about these things? <laughs> we're, not, we're not seeing some change, Gonzalez. Let's see. Yeah, I would love to to hear, and to hear more about before. you. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the IE, so the 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 big warehouses like the in Moreno Valley, where I talk about Moreno Valley, the World Logistics Center. There's a big fight around that. Um, it showed both the possibilities and the limits of those kinds of policy initiatives. Uh, especially policy initiatives in a region that is still kind of racially segregated when you're talking about uh, political leadership. Um, so, for example, um, so, you know, you think about a place um, uh, like Moreno Valley it's, and, and Riverside and, and San Bernardino County, most of the political leadership in those areas is very conservative and is very white. Um, in fact, out, you know, both counties, Riverside and San Bernardino, where a lot of this development is going on, both of those counties are historically uh, refuges from LA. There was a tremendous amount of white flight that left uh, LA County that moved into these regions. And there's a chart somewhere that I have that uh, shows how uh, the population of Republicans moving into Riverside and San Bernardino counties, into these inland counties, outstripped other places. So there was a concentration of white flight into these areas, and there was a concentration of conservative white flight into these areas, right? Um, and to this day, there are eight board supervisors who run the board of supervisors for both counties, and only one is not white out of those eight. Um, and all of them are Republican, right? And so, and Republican and conservative and embrace kind of racialized conservative politics. So the problem with the kind of legislative or a policy approach in a region where you have the population changing, right? Where there's a huge growth of, uh, of black and Latinx populations in these regions that hasn't, 
the, the political leadership hasn't caught up with that, right? So there's this massive political segregation, you know, that is happening where the leadership is mostly white conservative and the population is not. Um, and so when you're having an appeal and you're saying we need to have better policies, we need to stop this kind of development, the state, the local state that you're appealing to is conservative and white and not responsive to those kinds of pressures, right? And so it, it, it highlights that kind of limit. And so part of what has been happening is there to think about the growth of social movement politics to support movement organizing in order to create a more hospitable political terrain in which those kinds of policy appeals will actually take traction and hold, right? Because right now, for the most part, it's not happening. Fascinating. <clears throat> are, are there other questions we want to get in before uh, we close up? I think we have about four minutes left. You talked about legislation, executive action. What about litigation? Can you say something about litigation on these issues? Yeah, so part of the litigation um, has happened and recently, uh, two forms of litigation. One, environmental litigation has for the most part not has been effective, but effective at the port level. And again, I say this because it's, you know, there's been a lot of work by the National Resource Defense Council, et cetera, in coalition with the other environmental groups um, and, and that have sort of focused on looking uh, at and, uh, logistics and warehouse growth and the impacts that it's having on the, on, the, on the sort of urban environment, regional environment. That's been kind of successful in terms of limiting uh, some of the development. What's been l more successful actually is um, organizing between kind of juridical petitions, right? Saying we need to address these kinds of legal problems that are tied to on the ground organizing by communities and workers that are saying these kinds of uh, warehouse jobs are not paying us all of the wages that we earn. So they're still there. It's like wage theft, right? So some of the best uh, success, some of the, the biggest successes have been where there have been workers that are saying, well, Amazon and warehouse are in um, participating in wage theft and they're using illegal subcontracting rules uh, in order to hire us. And, and not to pay us what we're supposed to be paid. And then that has resulted in millions of dollars of back wages that are paid. And then that has also then allowed state led, uh, regulators to come in and say, well, we know that these legal cases have happened. We need to think about how it's happening across the industry. And we need to go in and start looking at enforcing uh, wage and hour violations across the industry. So that's brought some, some uh, level of relief, but for the most part, they have not been successful. The, the typical CEQA um, campaigns, you know, around environmental impact have not been successful models to stop and to limit uh, construction of these massive warehouses. And more, more, Moreno Valley is an example of that, primarily because they're already like build to spec orders. It's already written into the county's development plan. Uh, so a lot of these things are just sort of pro forma uh, because it's already been accounted for in earlier rounds of regional planning. Brad, did you want to jump in? Sure, I was just typing it, but I'll, I'll just say it as either. I was, I was just curious, like, what, I, as I understand it, the Longshore Union is, is still one of the most powerful unions in existence still, and, and, and also the provider of some really high paying blue collar jobs. And I was just wondering, like, where, it must, I don't really know much about it in terms of like topical news though. So I was just wondering, like, does the Longshore Union tend to take a stance? Like, and, and what's their, what's the, I don't even know what the makeup of their membership is like, but. Yeah, um, so the Longshore Union has for the most part not paid much attention to the expansion of warehouses. They're trying to keep um, all of their members that they have at the port